Another defeat for England at this year's Cricket World Cup. It's time for Ask George. Yeah, I don't like saying another defeat, but that's that's where we are, isn't it, George? Um, first one today is from Josh Caswell, who asks, just how short-sighted have England been heading into and during this tournament? Yeah, very um, complacent about ODI cricket. That's right. I look that we know their schedule's very busy, and we know that they had priorities that they thought were more pressing. But the fact is, they haven't yet yeah, prioritised ODI cricket, and it has come back to bite them on the ass. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, Simon Hodgson asks, "Can't bowl, irresponsible batting. Why is Ben Stokes actually here?" Well. Because of his record, because he went a long way to winning the 2019 World Cup for England. Um, And because the last time he batted before this tournament, he scored a record ODI score for England in ODI cricket. So, uh, you know, his reputation is excellent and he's deserved that reputation. You know, we know he's a very good player under pressure and all those things. I would have picked him once um, I was aware that he was available. And I think it would have been very hard for anyone not to. Having said that, it's not working. You know, it has thrown the balance of the side out. And um, he is also a very, very big personality, a positive personality, yes, but a very big personality. And maybe sometimes it's hard for other things to grow in the uh, shade of a very, very large tree. I don't know. But it's not working at the moment. It's a fair comment, but I'd have picked him. There's no point trying to be wise after the event. Mm -hmm. It would have been very brave not to pick him. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, on the topic of selection, um, Sushant has asked, shouldn't Harry Brook, Sam Curran, Gus Atkinson and Liam Livingston play every game? Is they the only ones who should be in ODI plans after the World Cup? Yeah, I think it's a, a fair play, a fair, fair point. Look, I would have said that until today because, yeah, it was all about planning for the next World Cup. But we learned today that there's a Champions Trophy. OK, sorry, we knew there was a Champions Trophy. Uh, at the start of 2025, but we didn't know that qualification was dependent upon position in the table in this tournament. With that in mind, you could argue that it would be better to play the full strength, well, what you perceive to be your strongest side right now in order to qualify. Um, so, so you know, that there are two sides to that. But yes, I would have been tempted to go young, uh, to invest in their futures, and because the older guys haven't worked. Well, on that topic of the um, the Champions Trophy, Jack Rule has asked, has the ICC done a disservice to the World Game by changing qualification rules for the Champions Trophy halfway through the World Cup? No, I don't think that's what's happened, to be no, fair, Jack. I don't think that's what's happened. They haven't changed the rules halfway through the World Cup. They changed the rules in November 2021, I think it was, mm. um, at a, an ICC board meeting. What they didn't do is communicate that change. And they really didn't. Um, th- there was a press release afterwards. It's not in it. I-, I checked with, you know, the various people I talked to at different governing bodies today. And um, uh, Trotty uh, at Afghanistan knew going into this tournament. Um, West Indies didn't, sorry, West Indies knew when they didn't qualify for the World Cup that they also hadn't qualified for the Champions Trophy. Uh, Sri Lanka didn't know until today and England didn't know until today so I think it's important for people to understand England would have had people in that board meeting so November 2021 I'm trying to think who would have been there Tom Harrison's time maybe Ian Watmore maybe Barry O'Brien I will need to check that they were in the room and they should have communicated it the England camp are saying that none of them knew until today this whole regime, the two Richards, it seems nobody knew until today. Now, I'm not saying it would have changed the way they played. You know, it's not like they're going to try any harder to win, is it? They're, they're trying to there's win. More, I mean, there's, so, there's been a bit of um, like people are sort of going, you know, well, it's a, we're halfway through and a lot of games are just dead rubbers now. But if maybe they'd known, you know, we might not make the top four, but if we make the top seven plus Pakistan will get through its championship mm. trophy. And now... Yeah, so, the so you could argue it's a return. good thing. You, you, you could argue it's a good thing that they've done mm. because it means that they, they aren't dead rubbers anymore. Mm. The, the rubbers we thought were dead 
maybe aren't because there's something else to play for. So you, I, I don't think it's a good rule because I think it's punitive on countries that didn't make the World Cup. And, you know, it would be nice for Zimbabwe and Scotland or whoever else, uh, West Indies, of course, to, to have an opportunity to qualify for the next global tournament. And it gets ever more clubby and uh, insular. So I think that's a mistake. But in terms of this tournament, yes, you could argue that uh, it would have kept teams uh, interested for longer. Yeah. Um, um, well, I, I just want to go back to the point. It does seem stunning in a professional sport with what, what's the ECB's turnover, four hundred forty million pounds a year, that we talk about attention to detail, and they don't know how to qualify for the next global tournament. I I find that staggering, to be honest. I think that is a Apps. I, I, I can't really even believe that we're, we're learning this. Mm. I mean, that is just the most. Imagine, imagine the FA saying, "Oh, we didn't know how you qualified for the Euros." Awkward. I mean, imagine that. Isn't it the same thing? Yeah. 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 World Cup, even. Christ. Yeah. Well. Um. Also on that topic, um. Danny has asked. Presumably, teams are paid by the ICC for playing in the Champions Trophy. How much does the ECB stand to lose from this performance? Yeah, there's great questions. That. <laughs> We're just coming back in a car from the ground and starting to try and talk about this stuff. Look, I, I, I mean, uh, I don't know what time it is. It's 11.30 at night in luck now. And trust me, the Wi-Fi has been a struggle to make this call, hasn't it? Um, so I don't know the answers to those questions yet. But uh, as I understand it, there'll be a participation fee for involvement in the tournament not a huge amount in the grand scheme of things. Some prize money, again, not a grand, uh, huge amount. But I think the real killer is the next ICC distribution would be based on uh, the, the each team's contribution to global events, partially anyway. So I think that the uh, CWI, Cricket West Indies, um, percentage of the revenue went from seven to five because they're not in this World Cup. So that will hurt. It will hurt them if they don't qualify. It will hurt England, just as it's hurt Cricket West Indies. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think it should be embarrassing. It should hurt in that way as well. It should sting financially. And it should sting in every way to, to not be at the top table anymore for the first time. I mean, in a way that you could argue that's good for global cricket because it's meritocratic and that's a good thing. And if someone like the Netherlands um, qualifies instead, you know, bloody good for them, eh? But just from a, a very insular uh, ECB point of view, that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that they didn't know how it worked. It's embarrassing that they might not qualify. That's, that's absolutely shambolic. Not great. Um, well, Matt has asked, or said, I suppose, it feels like everything should be changed, but what are the biggest slash most necessary changes that need to happen? It's a team at the end of the road. It is, uh, and it is a team at the end of the road. I agree with that. But I don't think that uh, changing a few personnel is the key thing. I actually think uh, a, a refocusing on priorities. Um, now, I know it's difficult to prioritise three formats at once, but other teams seem to do it a bit better. They don't have these, you know, huge boom and busts that we seem to get used to in England. So I think just a slightly different mentality of... Uh, focusing on three formats at once. I mean, other people do manage it, as I say. And, and that means, that's not just empty rhetoric. That means making sure that the schedule gives you a chance. I don't think the OBI schedule is at all clever. I don't think the domestic schedule is very clever. Um, you know, so a combination of those things, a reprioritization of ODI cricket without compromising T20 or Test cricket. England probably play too much. Um, we, we all know the reasons for that. But the, but the model isn't really working. Um, so, yeah, yeah, the short answer is reprioritization of the format rather than just picking different players right now. Yeah, well, um, Adam has asked, is there a need for a complete reboot of the England ODI team? And starting with the West Indies series, use players like Brew, Laws, Bahannon and Hayne instead of sending them to the Lions squad? Well, there's a case for it. I would say that, that most of those players you've mentioned feel more like Red Bull cricketers to me right now. I mean, Rue, yeah, interesting. You know, had a brilliant season and all the rest of it. But um, 
yeah, quite early, I think, for Hannon as well. Um, is he an ODI cricketer? It might be. He's an old-fashioned ODI cricketer. It would have been good today, I admit. <laughs> so th- those sorts of guys, um, they might be part of the solution, but I'm not sure that... You, you know, there's there's um, Jacks and Salt and um, the people that we've seen uh, play recently, you know, Brooke as well. Um, any, anyone who was in and around the Ireland squad, I guess, um, who, who were next in line. And and also there are a couple of younger players, uh, you know, Curran and what have you in this squad who, who maybe can come again and all the rest of it. So you don't want to completely throw out everyone, you know, maybe Josh Butler can be at the next World Cup. You know, he's obviously a very good player going through a very grim patch, but, you know, he has proved himself. And then there are questions to be made on people like Joe Root and Ben Stokes. Mm. And you don't have to answer them right now. Uh, you don't have to, you know, drop all 11, you know? But, but yeah, it's time for a bit of a reboot. It, it, of course it is. Mm-hmm. Um, background Noise has asked... Would you agree that in addition to the well-argued issues of preparation, age and form, that many England players also appear to be mentally exhausted? And if so, why are they more drained than other sides? Well, I think I can answer the second bit. is because they've Go just on. been awful. I think you are mentally exhausted. A, because of the heat, like the conditions are quite taxing if you're used to playing in England for a summer. But the, I don't know, I mean, there are... It, you, you 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 just get stuck in a rut, I suppose, and they all just look. I think, a bit I think you make a. I think I think you do make a really good point that there's nothing more tiring than disappointment, and they're a disappointed bunch, no doubt about that. So that's, you know, very fair observation. Um, I think the question's good though. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, tiredness, yeah. I mean, they're fit guys, you know. So I don't think it's necessarily physical, but I think there are a lot of miles on the clock mentally. It was interesting at the start of the tournament that both Australia and England struggled a wee bit. Australia bounced back, but they they play quite a lot of big games mentally. You know, a lot of adrenaline uh, comes out of them during the ashes. Um, none of these things are excuses, but they are factors. I think we ask a bit much of our our top cricketers I do in terms of the amount of time they're away and on the road and stuff but the problem is if you give them a break they'll go and play a franchise competition instead well golf so it's very very difficult to well I, I'm all for them playing golf yeah I, I couldn't give a toss if they go and play golf I couldn't give a toss if they go out and get drunk I I, I, I don't I, you know none of my business as long as they turn up fit and ready to play and I don't have an issue with their fitness they're just not playing very well um, so I do think that there is a legit question, a point in the question, which is that uh, English cricketers mm. l- look wearied and burned out quite often, and and quite often more than cricketers from other countries, and that is something that we should probably look at. Uh, they've got a bit better at mental health, in that they're better at giving people a break, but they haven't learned many lessons about the schedule. Mm. Schedule, yeah. pretty unrelenting and uh, it's all very well to say you can take a break but you can take a break and you let someone else in and that's that isn't it yeah exactly um well scott wellstead has asked if pakistan's legacy is being white hot and terrible from day to day is england's being very good for a while and then getting ruthlessly found out think of the 06 07 and 1314 ashes the end of the strauss slash flower eras and whatever this is yeah, I mean, absolutely, yes. I've been writing that a, a, a fair bit of late. I think I actually said it in my uh, tournament preview that it felt like a bridge too far for this team. I didn't think this would happen. I thought they might, didn't think they'd win it, but I didn't think this would happen. Craggy. Um Why does this happen? Well, um, a few reasons, lots of different reasons, but there are similarities between all those eras. Uh, a, a disinclination to move on, I think, uh, unites all of them. Uh, so you saw coaches that had great loyalty to players that were probably just past their best, either mentally or physically. Mm. Uh, and that came to came back to bite them. Also, teams that get hothoused, Andy Flowers' team in particular, um, was put under great sort of intense... Uh, it was an intense environment, and uh, it worked brilliantly for a while, but it broke people. And I think Andy would recognise that. Uh, there was a lot of good that happened then. 
And also, you know, and I hate to say it, but the base level of English cricket isn't probably as high as some of their key competitors, and it certainly hasn't been as high historically in Australia. And we're probably in a situation now in India as well, in that um, England have to sprint to keep up with these countries. They're very, very good. You know, India <laughs> were very, very good today. Their bowling attack is it's beautiful. You know, Mohammed Shami and uh, Kuldeep and stuff. I mean, the, the, the ball of just battle, maybe it is, it's kind of brilliant. Uh, Rohit Sharma, what did he get? 87. What's the highest England score? 27. Yeah, I've probably got those figures wrong, but ballpark. You know, there was a gulf between them. Uh, and that's kind of okay. But it also, it's just a reminder that um, England, in, in, sorry, in England, cricket is something of a niche sport. And um, it, it does feel that they have to be at their very best to compete with these teams. So when they do it, they maybe also get a little bit over celebratory, a little bit. I think there has been a bit of hubris in English cricket of late. I, 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 it makes me wince when they say they're saving Test cricket. They're doing brilliant things with the Test team. They are. They're doing brilliant things. But saving Test cricket, come on now. Um, equally, the the one day side, it's done brilliant things. But you know, whenever a side talks of eras, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. They've been brilliant, but um, they've probably, as I say, stuck to the same people a bit, a little bit too long. Um, and, and I think they're taking their eye off the ball in lots of ways. They've been a bit complacent as well. You know, they thought they could look at T20. They thought they could look at franchises. They thought they could look at Test cricket, and it would all come together with their ODI cricket. And then clearly, they've been caught out. Very clearly, they are. Yeah, it's a bit. I feel like um, I was talking to one of our colleagues saying it's very much, you know, we they got what two, two three nine two two nine, uh, and I still felt nervous. Well, even though oh, was, I see. Sorry, yes. yeah, it was a chaseable total, but I still wasn't convinced. And it's very much, I feel like, being a case of it's the hope that kills you in this tournament, even if it's a smidgen. It's 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 been one of them. Yeah, um, I don't like that today. Look, to be fair, England fielded very well today on the whole. Anyway, yeah, and much it, it better. looked sharp and really snappy, and and that made yeah. me. Yeah, and they bowled well. I'm saying, yeah. So, so there were some signs of improvement. If you yeah. want to take the positives, as they say. Yeah. Um, our last one for today comes from Peregrine Pocock, who asks, why do you think that games in this World Cup have been so one-sided? I think partly the way that um, teams now play ODI cricket and that they go hard. And if it doesn't work, they fall apart rather than trying to play sort of percentage cricket and just... Um, you know, try to get closer. Uh, and, and that's okay up to a point. I think that's one of the reasons anyway, yeah. England today got that, I think, catastrophically wrong. You know, it wasn't to go hard wicket. Mm. Um, I, you know, I think I've said in my match report that uh, the irony is that a player like Jonathan Trott, who is kind of the epitome of everything they wanted to move away from, would have been the perfect batter for a chase like this today. So I think that's one thing, the way that the game has changed and people go hard, you know, the answer to almost any situation is go harder. Um, and that means that, you know, you can get to a tipping point really quite quickly. Uh, and there is a sense that you might as well lose by 100 as 15. So I think that's one of the things. Uh, maybe there's just been a sense of not being very lucky uh, with some of the results. I don't know. But that, that anyway, that's one of my theories. Mm -hmm. Well, the next game is Australia is it on Saturday. Yeah, Australia. And, and, and what Australia can do, I love this. Australia can, I think, knock England out of two tournaments in the day. I mean, imagine roles are reversed. They're going to love it. They're going to love it. There's going to be no mercy. Mm -mm. It, they yeah. will, it will be brutal. And, and, you know, maybe England can turn it on. And, and England did show how you could beat India today, I thought. Yeah, they didn't get anywhere near doing it, but they they um they made them bleed for a minute, and they there is a long tail, so I think they've they've possibly shown how India can be beaten. Mm -hmm. They just didn't get anywhere near doing it, <laughs> and and of course in a two horse race, England can beat Australia, but um they're really not batting very well, are they? And that Australian bowling attack's pretty tasty. Yeah, I'm not wildly optimistic, Rio. <laughs> Well, I'll be going. And it's to a dry season. town. And the season yeah? two in the evening with some Australians. Really, nice. So we shall see. Um, uh, 
If you want to read more of uh, George's coverage from the World Cup, become a subscriber to the Cricketer Digital. We will be back on Saturday for whatever happens from the game against Australia. Cheers, George.